Hello, and welcome back. Uh, we are working our way through chapter four, and in this chapter, we are discussing quantitative data. Quantitative. I have a hard, hard time with that one. Uh, quantitative data. We're talking about displays and descriptions um, for how we work with quantitative data. In the previous video, we covered um, most of the displays, all of them but one. We're going to cover the next one in chapter five, the last one in chapter five. Uh, but uh, we covered the, the histograms, the stem and leaf plots, the dot plots, um, and how we create those things. In this video, we're going to be focusing a lot on the describe portion of uh, the, the title here. Um, how do we describe what these, uh, what these graphs look like? What are their features? How do we calculate those features? And how do we talk about them? Okay. Uh, so first and foremost, um, we want to make pictures. Okay. Uh, we have options for these displays and we want to think carefully about which display to make. Um, and before we make any of these displays, the stem and leaf plot, the histogram or doc plot, it's important that we think about this condition, okay, the quantitative data condition. And basically what that's saying is uh, the data values are a quantitative variable whose units are known. Uh, basically, you're, you're making a quick check right in the beginning. Uh, to make sure that what we're talking about is a quantitative variable, okay? Um, it's called the quantitative data condition because none of the things that we're about to do um, in the next two videos uh, make sense if we're talking about categorical var variables. It only works with quantitative variables, okay? So in the very beginning, we just double check to make sure we are in fact talking uh, with about a quantitative set of data, okay? so. Once we have decided, yes, it is a quantitative piece of data, we make our <clears throat> distribution. And when we describe this distribution, uh, we want to make sure we talk about three things, the shape, the center, and the spread. Okay, All three of these items, the shape, the center, and the spread, tell us something specific about the distribution. It is important that we address all of these, that way we are giving a full description about what the data is telling us. All right. Um, so let's talk about shape first. When we're talking about shape, we're asking three different questions. Does the histogram have a single central hump or several separated humps? Right. A hump being uh, like that. Right. Is it just a single hump? something like that, or is it multiple humps? And we have some words for that when it's got multiple like this, okay? So that's the first thing. Uh, we want to talk about where is the, the bulk of the data located, okay? The second thing is, is it symmetric? Uh, symmetry being, you know, we draw a line down the middle, we fold it over, and we see if it's uh, the same on both sides. Is it symmetric? And finally, are there any unusual features that stick out, right? Things like outliers or groups of data or, or something, okay? Are there any, is there anything unusual? So when we're talking about sh shape, we want to talk about these three questions. So let's uh, give you some vocabulary to be able to use to make these descriptions. So the first one, uh, does the histogram have a single central hump or several separated humps? Uh, humps in a histogram are called modes. Uh, you might remember that back when you were studying uh, statistics as a middle schooler, where we talk about the mean, median, and mode. Okay, A hump is a mode. It is that third measure of central tendency, the mode. Okay, Now, we have different names for different types of histograms. Uh, if the histogram has one main hump, it is dubbed unimodal, right? Une meaning one, right? Modal meaning mode, unimodal, one mode. Histograms with two peaks are called bimodal, right? Bi meaning two, modal meaning mode, two modes. Histograms with three or more we call multimodal. Uh, multi being, of course, many, okay? So uh, we can have many modes, multi modal. Again, when we're describing the, the bumps inside of a histogram, we want to use this type of vocabulary to do it. Is it unimodal, bimodal, or multimodal? 
So here's an example of a binomial, bimodal histogram. Uh, notice that there are two very distinct peaks. If I were to draw a line over this, it would definitely go up and then down and then up again and then down again. Okay. Notice that there's two very distinct bumps in this. Uh, if we were to change this histogram around a little bit, say add this one to be here and uh, maybe add this one to be here and this one to be like this. This is less distinct, okay? I this would probably not be considered bimodal because again, you're kind of going like this, right? This is, there's maybe a second one in there, but it's still, because there's this data being added into the middle, it really is much more like one big hump than it is two distinct humps. So do be careful with that, right? Small changes like this, we probably wouldn't consider that to be bimodal because there isn't a significant difference between these modes uh, in comparison to this one. Uh, whereas, again, with this depth, then yes, we definitely would call that bimodal. Uh, the last one that you might see a histogram called is a, a uniform histogram. And that's basically where all the bars are approximately the same height. You can see here, again, there isn't like a central bump. Most of it is about the same. Yes, there's some things that are a little bit different, but again, it's mostly the same. And we there's some there's some wiggle room in this right like this isn't perfectly uniform but it's basically uniform and so we would call it uniform all right uh, so there's some wiggle room in these descriptions symmetry now is is the histogram symmetrical can you fold the histogram along a vertical line through the middle and have the edges match pretty closely. This histogram below is, we would call this symmetric. Uh, we draw the line right here and we fold this over. And again, notice that it isn't perfect, but there's wiggle room here, okay? This is basically the same. It's not perfect, but it's basically the same when we fold it in half, so we would call that symmetric. Now, when it's not symmetric, <clears throat> and it looks kind of like this. These distributions are called skewed, right? Uh, the skew means that it has a tail going in one direction. There's a, there's a very definitive one central hump, but when we fold this over, notice that this tail runs a lot farther this direction, and this tail runs a lot farther this direction. Um, so these are considered skewed. This one over here is skewed to the left, this one over here is skewed to the right. The general rule being for when we describe it is follow the tail. Follow the tail, right? Uh, if the tail is moving to the right, then we're gonna say that it's skewed to the right. If the tail is moving to the left, then we're gonna call it skewed to the left, okay? Follow the tail. That tells us how the skew is going to work. Finally, anything unusual. Uh, sometimes the unusual features tell us something really interesting or exciting about a data set. Um, you should always mention any stragglers or outliers that show up um, inside of a, a distribution uh, because the outliers often tell a very interesting story. Um, for example, <clears throat> There is a, a data set in the book where it's talking about the average wind speeds uh, for a variety of days. I think it's actually in chapter five. And uh, one of the wind speeds is just massive. It's huge. It's a huge outlier um, in comparison to the rest of the data. And uh, so while that outlier doesn't fit with the rest of it, that outlier had a very interesting occurrence that day. It was a hurricane, okay? There was a hurricane on one of the days, and so the wind speeds were massively higher on that day because of a hurricane. So outliers and stuff like that tell interesting things about the data. So we do want to mark them. And then oftentimes, um, as a researcher, you're going to want to study what those things are. So outliers are good things to mention and find. You also want to talk about big gaps, right? Like why might you have, why is a certain distribution bimodal? Okay. If you get a bimodal distribution where there's like a gap in the data, you got like two things that look like this and with a gap in the middle, why is there a gap in the middle? What's this lack of knowledge? Okay. So uh, the, those often tell very interesting stories, and we want to uh, at least note them when we're describing the shape, all right? 
Uh, so here we've got uh, an interesting. Uh, here's a histogram that shows a possible outlier over here. Uh, again, note that I say I say possible outlier uh, because we will have a way in chapter five of. Uh, describing exactly how we de define what an outlier is um, but here we've got an outlier and it would and I don't know the story behind this one but it would be interesting to know why this one is so much lower than these ones over here uh, so finally th so there's my shape right when we're talking about the shape we answer those three questions we also want to talk about the second part the center um, so when we're talking about the center, we're, we're really asking ourselves this question. If we had to pick a single number to describe all the data, what number would we pick? Okay. Um, it's easy to find the center of it when a histogram is unimodal and symmetric. It's right in the middle, right? When we have a, a unimodal and symmetric bar graph, something that's kind of like that, the, the center should be easy to find because it's whatever is in this bar in the middle right here. However, uh, when things are skewed or if there's more than one mode, then finding the center can be a little bit more difficult and interesting. So um, there's two measures that we use to find uh, a center piece. Uh, I'm going to go back to this slide for a second. Uh, they are the mean and the median. Um, both of them describe the center. Remember, uh, back to your seventh grade uh, statistics, the mean is the average and the median is the middle number. Uh, this is an important distinction because depending on the shape of the histogram can change what the average, uh, whether we should use the, the average as the center number versus when we should take the median as the center number. Um, so we will we'll talk about the differences between those two in a future video. Uh, but for now, it's just about recognizing the, the difference between them. The mean means I'm taking all of these values, like every single uh, number in this frequency, I'm adding them all up, and I'm dividing by um, how many there are. Uh, in general, if you're unimodal and symmetric, that's going to give you a number that's right there. Because these numbers are going to balance out these numbers to give us right in the middle. The median, again, on a unimodal and symmetric, is also going to be right in the middle. I order all of the numbers from least to greatest. And when I do that, this happens. However, when we change the, uh, the look of the, <coughs> excuse me, when we change the, the look of the histogram, uh, that does, that whether we should use the median or the mean, uh, does change. For example, uh, if we were to calculate the mean of this particular histogram, notice that it's got a lot of numbers on the lower end than on the bigger end. This is not a symmetric histogram, right? We've definitely got a tail leading off to the left. So while the biggest hump is right here at 7.0, if we were to add all of these up and divide by how many there are, we're going to get a number that's closer down here. Because these values, these outliers, affect the mean. Outliers change where the mean goes. And so with an outlier on the left-hand side, we're going to end up shifting the mean to the left, even though that may necessarily not be center. However, if we were to order them from smallest to biggest, the median a low number down here is going to have the same effect as one number right here. So the median will actually be closer to this center piece. So the median is going to look better than the mean in this case because the tail, the outlier, is going to shove the mean to the left, whereas the median is going to stay fairly close to this central all right, and that's it for this video. Uh, our last video of this series is going to talk about how we measure spread, uh, because there's some, uh, there's definitely a new calculation in there that uh, uh, you may not have covered in your initial seventh grade statistics when we're talking about things. So um, that'll be in the third video in this series. Thank you for watching this one, and we will see you another time. Bye.